Hello guys and welcome back, as always, to Let's Talk About It. Given that Easter is upon us, what better topic of conversation than something dark and macabre? Which is why today's video is all about Easter Sunday murders. Today's first story is about a man named James Rupert. The youngest son of Charity and Leonard Rupert, he was looked at far less favourably than his older brother Leonard Jr who took on the role of man of the house after the death of the boy's father when they were 12 and 14, respectively. An imposed role in which Leonard Jr. continued his father's lack of affection towards James, which continued into adulthood. As an adult, James Rupert was pretty average in both appearance and success, and was considered to be modest, bookish and generally helpful. Traits which didn't make him particularly respected or feared, or which the lion can be fairly fine, within his community or even within his own family. Something that James was fully aware of, especially in comparison to his brother who, by 1975, the year in which this story takes place, had a degree, owned his own house in Fairfield, Connecticut, and had married and fathered eight children with a woman named Alma, who just so happens to be James's ex-girlfriend. All the while, James was considered to be somewhat of a failure for the way his life was going. He never married, he found it difficult to find and keep work as a draftsman, and he had lost all of his money during the 1973 to 1974 stock market crash, for which he was now financially indebted to his family. With the pressure of life weighing him down, and suffering from a deep depression, James knew that he needed to take matters into his own hands. And so, on March 30th, 1975, he decided to solve his problems once and for all. Because it was on this date, an Easter Sunday in Hamilton, Ohio, that Charity Rupert had invited her eldest son Leonard over with his family for Easter lunch. Whilst Charity, Leonard, his wife Alma and their eight children enjoyed themselves, having food, playing games and enjoying the holiday season, James was upstairs sleeping off a hangover, something that he regularly did, much to the disapproval of his family. But then, at around 4pm, James woke up and the first thing he did with efficiency and focus was to load a 357 Magnum, two handguns and a rifle. Then, armed with his weapons, he went downstairs and entered the kitchen. In the kitchen, he found his mother, Charity, his brother, Leonard Jr, and his sister-in-law, Alma, having a conversation. Before any of the adults knew what was happening, James shot his brother in the head, killing him. He then turned one of his weapons to Alma, shooting her in the chest and killing her. And then finally, he turned the weapon onto his mother, whom he shot twice, killing her. As the three adults lay in bloody heaps, either dead or dying on the kitchen floor, James did something unthinkable. Because in the kitchen was not only the three adults that he had now murdered, but there were three children as well. And so with the same lack of empathy he had for the adults, he gunned down David, 11, Teresa, 9, and 13 year old Carol. Leaving the kitchen in a calm manner, James then entered the living room where he found the rest of Leonard and Alma's children. And then, in cold-blooded fashion, he proceeded to execute them with a single bullet to the head, followed by a second to ensure their deaths. These victims were Anne, 12, Leonard the third, 17, Michael, 16, Thomas, 15, and the youngest member of the family, four-year-old John. Three hours after the murders, James called the police and he waited for them at the front door. When they arrived, they quickly discovered the gruesome scene and it said that there was so much blood, it was dripping through the floorboards where it stained the wooden framework within the basement. After his arrest, James was uncooperative with police. But over time, it became very clear that he had severe paranoia and suffered from extreme levels of delusion. Because of this, he was convinced that his mother and brother were in cahoots with the FBI 
with their aim being to prove that James was a homosexual, which is said to have been the imagined breaking point that led to James committing the murder of his entire family. At his trial, James pleaded insanity, with his aim being to serve a minimum term, during which he would be cured of his insanity and then be able to collect his family's inheritance. And so, in 1982, after several retrials, James was found guilty of the murder of his mother, Charity Rupert, 65, and his brother, Leonard Jr., 42, but was found not guilty of murder on the grounds of insanity of the nine other victims of what became known as the Easter Sunday Massacre. The next story I have for you took place at Easter of 1937 and involved the murder of three people by an American artist and sculptor named Robert Irwin. Before he became a killer, Robert Irwin, who was often said to be brilliant, erratic and at times violent, already had a troubled past. Born in 1908 to evangelist parents, Robert lived an impoverished childhood and spent much of his adult life in and out of mental health facilities, with one 1932 stay being the result of him trying to cut off his penis with a razor blade. But Robert was also an accomplished and talented sculptor who was hired to create busts of famous people, including former President Franklin D. Roosevelt, and he's also hired by a Los Angeles studio to create waxworks for them. And it was this combination of his personal struggles and his well-known talents that led to him being labelled the mad sculptor after the media became aware of the murders he had committed. Murders which happened after Robert descended further into madness, with the lead up to the tragic event starting after he moved to a New York based rooming house owned by a woman named Mary Gideon. It was during this time that Robert became infatuated with Mary's daughter Ethel, a feeling that was not shared by her. As Robert's mental health continued to spiral, he ended up spending two years in a mental hospital. It was then, upon his release in the summer of 1936, that Robert discovered that the love of his life, Ethel Gideon, had married a man named George Kudner. The news devastated Robert and led to him creating a bust of Ethel with a cobra coiled around her neck. Later, in a seeming effort to distract himself from his problems, Robert enrolled himself in the Theological School of St. Lawrence. However, on March 18th, 1937, he was expelled for instability. With nothing left to lose, Robert gave himself two choices. Number one, to drown himself in the East River, or secondly, to make his way to Mary Gideon's rooming house. On this day, Robert chose the latter. On reaching his former home, he first encountered Mary. After she asked him to leave, Robert stabbed her and then strangled her to death. Sometime later, he was confronted accidentally by Mary's other daughter, Veronica Gideon. After terrorising the young woman, Robert eventually stabbed and strangled her to death too after Veronica used his name. Fearing that other tenants may have heard him and may also know his name, Robert searched the house where he found another tenant, a man named Frank Burns. And so, to silence another potential witness, Robert stabbed him to death as well. With the tragic irony being that Frank was entirely deaf, had no idea of what just occurred within the house or even of Robert's presence. Despite the brutal nature of the crime, it only stayed in the headlines long enough to catch Robert Irwin due to a dark coincidence that Veronica Gideon just so happened to be a popular pulp magazine model. A genre that focused heavily on horror and violence and sex that accidentally mirrored the crimes that James had committed, which had turned, for many people, a fantasy into a reality. Upon his arrest, Robert confessed to police that he had originally intended to kill Ethel Gideon because not only was she the love of his life, but she was the dearest object in the world. But upon arriving at the house and discovering that Ethel wasn't there, he had then accidentally killed his three victims, making for a lucky escape for Ethel, but a tragic end for Mary, Veronica and Frank. <laughs>
The final story I have for you of Easter murders took place in the small town of Colfax, Louisiana in 1873, when a politically and racially motivated battle took place between mostly black Republican voters and the all-white Democratic voters. The violence that unfolded was set against a backdrop of a highly contested 1872 governor's election with the results seeing the Republicans narrowly retaining control of the state of Louisiana, much to the disgust and the disbelief of the Democratic supporters. With tensions rising, Republican office holders occupied the Grant Parish Courthouse, which was being guarded by around 60 black freedmen, those freed from slavery, and state militia. And then on April 13th, 1873, 300 armed white men, many of them being members of white supremacist groups, attacked the Grant Parish Courthouse. After exchanging gunfire, the Democratic attackers of the courthouse threatened the use of a cannon, resulting in the Republican defenders either fleeing or surrendering to be taken prisoner. Logically, this should have been seen as a victory for the attackers, but unfortunately, that wasn't the case because in a somewhat unpredictable turn of events, the leader of the attackers, James Hadnot, was accidentally shot and killed by one of his own men. It was at this moment that the white supremacists started to execute the black militia members that had already surrendered to them. But after murdering these men, the white democratic voters, hell-bent on revenge, didn't stop there, because their attack went on throughout the night, where, Indiscriminately, they murdered any African-American man they could find, even those who had not even been present at the courthouse during the initial confrontation. By the end of the massacre, approximately 153 people had lost their lives, three of them being white, 150 of them being black. After the brutal slayings, very few arrests were made and even fewer convictions were handed out for the disturbing event that was described by historian Eric Foner as the worst instant of racial violence during Reconstruction, an historical period in the US with its aim being to redress the inequalities of slavery and to reunite the country in the wake of the Civil War. Well guys, that brings me to the end of another video. If you got something out of it, please hit the like button. If you haven't already, please hit the subscribe button. I would really appreciate it. Otherwise, leave your comments below. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.